All right. Um, so welcome everyone. Welcome to CEO Fireside Chats. Um, my name is Shayla Jackson and I have the privilege of serving as a legal counsel for women CEOs and small business owners, as well as being the founder of Build a Legit Biz, which is an education hub for today's CEO teaching on the laws of doing business. But tonight I am your host for this September um, episode of CEO Fireside Chats. It is the first of, I'm hoping of many, that really was birthed out of a conversation I had with tonight's guest. So CEO Fireside Chats is basically a conversation with CEOs for CEOs. This is all about learning what you need to know or want to know about running your business, how to build wealth, and also how to build a legacy for generations to come. So tonight and September's topic is wealth building through strategic business tax strategies. And I have with us our special guest, John Drayton, who is also my tax guy and the tax guy's tax guy, who is CEO of Drayton Tax Pros. So John, welcome. I'm so glad to have you. And, you know, come, come on in, introduce yourself. Let us know a little bit about who you are and how long you have been running Drayton Tax Pros. Well, uh, good, uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Shayla, for allowing me to be here. Um, I'm, I'm definitely, uh, definitely grateful for this opportunity. And, and just like you said, this, this, uh, this stem, literally stemmed from a conversation that you and I were having. And it was just me rambling and rambling and rambling. You like, you know what, we've got to get people in front of this because this is too good to miss. Um, I have been uh, practicing taxes since 2015 professionally. Uh, before that, um, it was always just kind of like a, a perusing over, you know, a tax return or helping out, you know, you know, my, myself or a friend here and there. Said, oh, nah, this is not what you got to do. You got to fix this. This is not right. You missed this. You missed that. And then, you know, I would make a few changes. And the next thing you know, uh, a person would have, uh, excuse me, sorry about that. I would make a few changes. The next thing, next thing you know, a person had like an extra $3,000 coming into their um coming into the, you know, for the tax refund. So uh, this really just kind of stemmed from from that. And, um, and, and literally, you know, years later, here we are now. Um, I started working with the, uh, with uh, an organization, a nonprofit in Maryland that targeted to, um, to helping uh, low income and middle class families. Uh, I did really well with that. I, I trained along with the uh, IRS representatives from out of the uh, Landover office in, in Maryland. And at the end of my program, I liked it so much uh, that I wanted to try to find the way that I could get involved and just kind of stay involved because I, I felt at that time that the service that I was providing was definitely necessary and that people that I would come across that, you know, did tax at that time, they just did not relay the information in a manner that our people could really resonate and, and understand what was going on. Um, and that's, you know, that, 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 I want to say that, uh, that that fall before I even finished the program, I started trading tax professionals and I, and here we are now, seven years later. I love it. I love it. Seven years later, right? Um, so John, you talked a little bit about how you were saving your clients money, especially $3,000 here and there, but um, altogether, how much would you say approximately you saved your clients after seven <laughs> years? Uh, after seven years? Oh man. Um, Just a ballpark. I would say in, in total uh, returns, I've gotten my client, I've gotten at least maybe five to $600,000 of people's monies back in that, in that time. And again, that's just, this is just me, my operation. Um, you know, I, I just kind of branched out, you know, later on you know, last, last year with a partner of mine who, uh, you know, has been truly uh you know helpful in, in allowing us to expand and reach more people um but i hope to uh you know i hope to to one day be able to say that i've gotten back you know you know six hundred thousand dollars in one tax season that would be a, a highlight uh i would say uh, that's very in, in, in the very near future that is uh definitely um foreseeable so guys, you know, you're coming in. So John and I are, you know, actually, you know, we're friends. He's the husband of a, a friend of mine from college. Um, and so, you know, 
this CEO, CEO fireside chat is really a chat between two CEOs, two friends. So John is a very humble guy. And you see how he just glossed over the five hundred dollars to $600,000 that he has saved his clients in seven years. So this is not, you know, John is not someone who is, you know, just shooting breeze and we just sitting here, you know, just making up a conversation. Like he has actually saved his clients money. And we're going to talk about tonight how you can take some of this information he's going to literally take out of his brain for this next, what, 45 minutes so that you can begin saving yourself some money as you run and operate your business. So, um, you know, of course, John, we're here, we're talking about wealth building strategies through taxes, but I'm just going to ask the question, can you actually save money through taxes? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, yes, you absolutely can save money through, uh, through taxes. I mean, that's uh, one of the, you know, if you don't mind kind of going into the, 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 one of the questions, I think that common mistakes that businesses make when you know when it comes to taxes first and foremost is you know misreporting income or failing to report income or over reporting your income um you know sometimes people have cases where they think that you know oh uh this i have this i have accounts receivables of you know you know thirteen thousand dollars so i need to you know i need to count this you know or i have you know for whatever the reason may be, these you know we're we're black businesses. We we haven't done this before. A lot of us, we have not encountered you know this this wave that we're kind of going along, and we make it. We are making mistakes. You know, most of the mistakes, as I said, misreporting income. You know, trying to write off a hundred percent of our meals. You know what I mean? Listening. You know, you have those conversations with your friends. Oh yeah, I, oh yeah, I'm I'm about to, we're about to go eat some shrimp tonight. We about to go eat you know a steak dinner. All right, what's the whole, what's the bill? Oh, the bill, $400, don't worry, it's on business. You know, it's, it's that misrepresentation of the uh, conversation we have with ourselves that we kind of do ourselves in. You know, we set up a business, but we, we mix our businesses with our personal finances. You know, mm. we, we, mm. Fail to, we fail to do, you know, tax planning at all. There's a difference between tax planning and tax preparation. So hold on, John, hold on just one moment, because we're going to, we're going to get into that, but let's, let's, let's take this a little bit slow, right? So you were talking about <laughs> one main thing that I know is really, really big when it comes to not just, um, you know, talking about saving money through taxes, right? Um, which is being able to write right now is that when you um mix your you know your your personal with your business expenses one of the things that you can do is you could literally um eradicate the liability protection of even having an llc or, or corporate entity altogether so that's just the legal side coming out which is basically when you do that you're not just met, you know getting in trouble possibly with the irs who could audit you but the whole purpose of having a, a legal entity is to separate and protect your personal finances from your business. And when you mm -hmm. mix your funds, all of a sudden now you and your business are one, which means mm -hmm. they can come after your personal money. And that's Correct. what you want to avoid. Correct. So, John, explain to us what's the difference between tax planning and tax prep? All right. Well, to keep it simple, right? Planning helps you optimize your tax situation before you actually go report it okay um you want to you know when you plan you're 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 looking at strat legit legitimate strategies to help you realize the potential tax consequences that you that you may face as an entity based off of your goals or your plans for the future okay um and what um so some of, the, some of the things when I say like tax legit strategies, right? How to manage your tax bracket, right? That, that's planning, you know, how to use tax losses to har harvesting, you know, offsets with your capital gains. You know, what does that even mean? You know what I mean? When you, when you come, when you're starting as a business, you know, if, some, if I mention that to you, you know, during the tax, you know, as well as I'm preparing your taxes, you have no idea what that means. And that 
small black businesses, how they lose, because there's language that we literally do not know what's going on, and that is what's causing us to to lose out. Mm, um, mm, that's good right there, right? That there is language. There's a language to this tax and wealth game that if we don't know the language, we can't necessarily play the game well so that we can get mm -hmm. That's so good, John. That's so That's right. good. And, and, right, tax, go and tax preparation, preparation is, is simply just helps you file your taxes, right? Just making sure that you're complying with both the federal and the state laws. That is it. The issue is that you have sometimes, you know, we'll come a business owner will come into a tax separation site and they say, okay, look, here's my papers, work it out. That is not tax preparation. You are setting yourself, you do that, you are setting yourself up to be, you're putting, you're putting, you're really putting the skills of the individual you're working with to test because you, you know, sometimes, you know, you're trying out somebody new, you don't know what their capabilities are and you're literally saying, hey, this is my baby. Here you go. Don't don't do nothing wrong. But there's no instruction. When it comes to tax preparation, there has to be instruction. You are instructing that process for the preparer that you're working with. If you fail to provide your preparer with instructions, right? Essentially, you are failing to plan. You're, you're I'm sorry. You're, you're planning to fail. Sorry. You're planning to fail if you, if you fail to plan. So I have a question that others may be wondering, right? Because we just talked about how you have to know the language, but many of us are coming into business or already in business and we don't know the language. So without knowing the language, how can we give instructions when it comes to time to tax prep, right? Because I just want to make that distinction and, and bring it out is that tax planning is using all of the strategies from loss, tax loss, harvesting, um, you know, managing your income tax bracket, all of that takes place before you get to April where you are tax prepping, right? When you mm -hmm. turn all your receipts, all of your papers over to the tax person, the tax guy, if it ain't Drayton tax pros, <laughs> put a plug there, but the tax guy so that he can do your tax return, right? That's tax prep. But you were talking about you know, with uh, the, the tax preparer giving them instructions. So how do we do that if we don't necessarily know the language to even give the instructions? What you want to do is you want to find yourself someone before tax season starts to establish a plan, right? So here we are right now. It's, uh, it's September. We're going to October. It is not too late right now to do tax planning, right? Sometimes you can do, you can find uh, sometimes a tax preparer that's good at tax planning. Sometimes you can find you no know, planning with an accountant. Sometimes you can find planning with a, with a CPA. It varies, you know, or it might take you looking at what is the IRS law right now that I can read for myself and figure out what applies to me. Tax planning starts before tax season it can be any time before tax season but once you kind of in in the window tax planning it, it kind of it starts to narrow because then you then you start to perplex yourself with oh you know i can just i can just plan for my taxes in january you know tax seasons you know ends april i'll get i'll get to it in you know in march right and then you look and you're reading you know, you've seen all these posts from from, uh, from tax advisors. Now you're looking at prices. Now you're looking at all these different, you know, people on Instagram, on Facebook, on, you know, these um, on, on Clubhouse telling you all these different things that you can do. Now you're bombarded. Right. So at the time when before, when you could have had the chance to really look and plan and see and pick and select and look for yourself. Now you're confused because you're looking at ABC, you know, Mary Jane, Dick. In uh, in, in H and R Block, and seeing all these people tell you all these things that you can do, and now you you don't even have a plan because you're running around in a circle. Mm -hmm. Then you come to then you come to you know, you like you know what? I know this, I know this, I know. This. I'm just gonna pick one, and I'm gonna tell them that this is what they need to do. That's not planning. So that's that's good right there, right? Tack, you know, failure to plan will lead you to failure, but it also runs you into possible confusion because. Now, if you wait until the new year, you're looking at what everybody else is doing, which, you know, there's a lot of people throwing themselves out as experts and gurus, but that doesn't mean that's the right 
expert for your business. Mm-hmm. And what I hear you saying is essentially you have to sit down and really plan this thing out. Sit down and look at, you know, sit down with someone, either a CPA, tax preparer, someone who has the knowledge who can help walk you through this thing and really help you come up with a plan. Sorry, guys, I live next to uh, uh, whatever this thing is that keep on everybody, especially tonight, wants to go through, right? That's how, that's sometimes how it is when you're doing something important and then like all of a sudden noise kicks up, like, come mm-hmm. on now. Yeah. I wasn't doing that an hour ago. Now, coming back to this, right, um, is to really sit down with someone who can walk you through, you know, the language, understanding what you need to do with your specific income bracket. Because some of you guys may have jobs, right, including your business, which is, a, you know, more income. Some of you may be married. That's a whole nother piece to this tax prep business. But one of the things that I want to point out And I think it was in there in what you said, John, which is when you get to the new year, now you're tax prepping because tax planning is before January 1st, Mm -hmm. because once the year rolls over, that tax season is for the one you just came out of. So, you know, this this season that we're, we're going into that we're in right now is usually when the wealth are doing the last leg of their tax planning before December 31st ends so that when the tax prep season comes, they've already planned for how to lower their, manage their taxable income and lower their taxes and all of that. So John, let's talk a little bit about, um, let's talk a little bit about like the different business structures, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're talking about managing our taxable income and so, you know, I don't know how, um, how tax savvy everyone is, right? We all come in with different languages. And I want to make a point about that because John was saying, go look at the tax code for yourself to see if you could teach yourself. Look, if you could do that, all praises to you, okay? I tried, I have a law degree and I had to sit down for a little bit longer to make sure I understood <laughs> the tax code. And I think they do that for a reason. But there are some things that you can't teach yourself. And I remember looking once and just seeing how the the individual income tax bracket is very different than the corporate tax bracket. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, usually people start and they're like, okay, just get an LLC. But can you just talk a little bit about, um, you know, what are the advantages and maybe disadvantages of when it comes to tax strategies, wealth building? from an LLC to a partnership to a um, S corporation, C corporation, and even people who want to start out as sole proprietors, mm-hmm. which I have asked y'all not to do that. You know, this okay. is not legal advice. Let me just say that. I got you. Okay, but yeah, All right, okay. well, let me, let me talk about the sole prop just for a moment, okay? Because there, there are some cases where, you know, being a sole proprietor may work, right? You know, there are some good things and there are some bad things, right? The structure of a sole of a sole proprietorship, right? One, there's no distinction between you and the business, right? Um, you know, as a sole proprietor, you're also you're entitled to all of the profits. Um, but on the other flip side, you know, you are responsible for everything, right? The good, the bad, and the ugly. Okay, so if you make a mistake and you're sole proprietor, you know. Those losses are your losses. You know, those mistakes are your mistakes. Um, then when it comes to taxes with a sole proprietorship, you know, your business and your personal taxes are not separate. They're 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 intertwined. Okay, um, you're going to be using a Schedule C and a and a 1040. Um, you will be paying the uh, the self employment tax, which uh, which you know, depending on how you're doing, you know, financially, that could be a good thing or that can be a a not so good thing. Okay, now the advantages, the advantages, you know, tax wise of having a sole proprietorship is that you typically have the lowest rates of the structures, lowest taxes of the structure, right? It's very quick and inexpensive to form. You know, you can wake up one day and say, you know what? Um, I want to, you know, I'm, my name is Beverly Banks and I am going to start, you know, Banks Incorporated. And that's, you know, that's going, that's going to be my, my proprietorship. You know, I want to do a basket weaving business, whatever. That's what you, that's what you do, right? You have sole control. Beverly has control, right? Elizabeth has control. Jimmy has control. Shayla has control of the sole proprietorship, meaning no one 
can step in and, and override to tell you what to do because it's your show, okay? Um, and um, and you only file taxes one time, right? It's just one time you want to file. You put in your schedule C, you put in your 1040, boom, we're done, right? Now, the disadvantages of a sole proprietorship is you there is an unlimited personal liability, okay? An unlimited personal liability, meaning that if something goes wrong with the product that you sell or services you do and you don't have a structure in place, you can be financially ruined, okay? Um, and another disadvantage of having a sole proprietorship is it is extremely hard to raise capital because it's, it's hard for, you know, an entity or the people with the money to get behind you and say, you know what? I'm going to go behind this basket weaving business, but, you know, uh, I don't think I want to do it. It's a little bit too risky, okay? Um, so that, and that, 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 that's everything for the sole proprietorship. John, let me jump in real quick, right? Because mm -hmm. we're talking about wealth building, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about through tax strategies. But what John said is so important, which is with a sole proprietor, if, you know, as you grow your business, if you're looking to bring on investors, if you're looking to expand, if you're looking to get grants, it's a little bit harder to do that when there's no distinction between you and your business as a sole proprietor, because that's what it is. There's you and your business are one. You, your assets, the business assets are one. Liability all on you. So that's just another distinction because grants and business credit, building your business credit up, as well as getting investors are another wealth building tool. But that's for another conversation maybe one day. So we're going to get back to the tax stuff with my man, John. So that was all for us so far. I think now you're about to tell us about LLCs. Um, actually, I was going to go to partnerships. All right, um, partnerships. So partnerships, right, um, their structure is a little bit different, right? In a partnership, you have you know, two or more people, okay? Um, the, the, another another you know, benefit of the structure is that it's sharing profits and losses, okay? Now, there are different types, you know, general, uh, there's an equal, um, equal division partnership, you know, limited liability, I'm uh, sorry, limited partnership, uh, limited liability partnership, and then there's also like a joint venture. Now, from a tax perspective, uh, you know, partners, they can file a return. Uh, they can file, partners file a return of income for the business, right? But they also uh, file their taxes personally on their share of the income or the losses, okay? Um, advantages to a partnership, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, a partnership is also quick and for the most part inexpensive to form, right? It's easy to acquire funding from a partnership, say, hey, you know, Shayla, you got 10 grand. Hey, I'm John. I got 10 grand. Let's let's do a partnership. Let's sell some things. All right. Yeah, let's do it. Um, you know, and another advantage of, you know, if Shayla's like, you know what, John, I don't think I want to, you know, partner with you no more. Uh, I want to partner with, you know, somebody else. I want to partner with uh, William, you know, so that's another advantage of a partnership, right, is that the number of partners can change over time, right? Or she can say, hey, John, you know, you're good. But I know I, I met this guy. You know I think he's going to be a good addition to our team. Let's bring him on. You know what I mean? That's that's a that's a good thing about a partnership. Um, now it's disadvantages for a partnership. You know you lack of complete control, right? So if you're used to kind of like being the one that says, you know, I rule. This is how I want it to be. It's got to go this way. It's my way or the highway. That's not gonna, you know you're going to have a lot of um, a lot of headbutting. You know in this in this type of um, business um you're personally liable you know, the business you know, the partnership is personally liable for the debt of the part of the partners so that liability is there and another thing that kind of leads to a lot of disillusions of partnerships is disputes right you know one person wants to do you know if you have a you know joe's boxing gym you know you got joe and you got mac Joe wants things to be done this way because he's a he's he's a he was a boxer, and you know Mac might want things to be done another way because you know Mac had a uh, you know experience on the business side of boxing, and sometimes those things can mesh well, but those can also kind of be deterrents that kind of drive us or wedge us apart. So you know that's you know the disadvantages you know as far as you know, tax wise from um from your uh from for that. Um, All right, so we have about, because um, I want to make sure we end on time and we get to the other questions. Mm -hmm. So 
Um, I don't know if anyone has a corporation, but maybe what we can do is talk about LLCs because that's the most common one. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe a little bit about uh, corporations because I really want to get into the tax strategies, especially with kids, spouses, and some of the business expenses that um, business owners can write off. Okay. All right. So let's talk about the limited liability co- LLCs, right? Structures with the uh, LLCs, they, they mix between you know, corporation, uh, corporate uh, I'm sorry, a corporation and, and partnership, right? Owners are considered members. Um, and there is a process when you set up an LLC, right? Obviously, you have to choose your name, right? Which, you know, you do for your business, but you have to file your articles of organization. You have to do an operation, an operating agreement in place. You have to do, uh, you know, get your licenses and your permits. Now, from a tax perspective, uh, partners, they file their, their personal returns, right? The forms that they need you need an, uh, an LLC, you have to have a form 8832 to, free, to be able to file as a business. Um, advantages, you know, it's, it's limited liability, you know, flexible use as a partnership, you know, kind of wingle between the two. Um, it's easy to raise capital when you're an LLC and there's fewer restrictions on profit sharing. Um, and also um, the surplus of your earnings are not taxed, which is a huge thing, okay? Um, some disadvantages, uh, for having an LLC is you're subject to the self-employment tax and then uh, leaving members can dissolve in certain states. So you have to check with the, you know, with, you know, with the state that you're operating in or operating out of, um, because if you, uh, if you, you know, if a member decides they don't want to be a part of the LLC anymore, you, you may have to dissolve and kind of start all over again. Okay. So um, one of the things you, you mentioned, right. So with the LLC, because I don't, I don't know if it's really clear that, the sole proprietor, the partnership, and the LLCs are all um, organizations, all business entities, um, essentially, that the income passes down to the individual tax return. So all of this is passed through. Can you talk about, um, right, because there are some different things, if someone has an LLC, at what amount of money they have coming in per year should they consider a different tax election? Well, okay. Well, when, so that's going to vary. Okay. From, from, from business, from, from entity to entity, right? When an LLC considers to go to a a different tax lesson, right? You have to, you have to first file your form 8832, right? To select your, Let's not get into the specifics, right? Because we can look, we can get we can get in. Look, look, look. John is such a uh, he is a one of excellence, right? So y'all see he detail, he he giving y'all all the instructions, right, of how you do this. We not let's not get into the details. Let's what's the amount? What's the dollar amount? That like when you get to when you hit this dollar amount of revenue per year, they need to think about a different tax election. That is uh that that's a tough that's a tough answer a tough question to answer only because that that dollar amount is different for different people right okay if you have uh you have um uh, if you have a uh, if you're a, a, an llc if you're a single member llc right you know you might be thinking things are fine and once you hit uh once you cross the eighty thousand dollar threshold you know you start finding yourself paying more money in taxes you're like man this is this sucks this sucks you know, i want to do something different but also it, re- it revolves around what is this entity doing that is going to you know what what type of business election are you doing right do you have real estate if you have real estate you may not want to opt for changing out that election because it might the odds may be against you by going into a different uh into a a tax election so there's so many other different factors to to consider before you know just upping deciding going from uh from from an llc to an s corp or from a partnership to a c corporation um, and that one, I think, would take a lot more time than what we have in this uh, in this in this discussion to kind of really explain that, you know, thoroughly. So what John just gave y'all is the accountant's version of the lawyers. It depends. <laughs> like that's that's what he just gave. <laughs> lawyers, we say it depends. Tax guy said, well, it takes a little bit more time and a little bit more analysis. But basically, what I heard you say is when your income takes you into another tax bracket and you are paying more taxes, then you might want to consider a different tax um, election, right? And when we say tax election, what we're talking about is specifically as an LLC, 
you are taxed as a sole proprietor, meaning as an individual. There's no difference between your tax election at the federal level when you have an LLC. But if you start paying more taxes, say you are making $80,000, $100,000 in your business, you can file a form, which John was about to go into, to change your tax election. And you can change it to be taxed as an S corporation or a C corporation. Um, because when you get taxed as those corporations, you can then do some more strategies tax-wise and corporations get taxed twice. So John, now that we're talking about LLCs bringing in the money, right? Mm -hmm. Taxes are going up. What are some other things that they can consider at that time, right? So instead of paying more in taxes, what are some legal ways that they can lower their tax bill? Well, um, if you have children, that is, uh, you know, say you have, you know, two kids, okay? Um, I'd say put your kids on payroll, okay? Um, now, listen to me, but I say this. Put your kids on payroll because each child that you have, you can essentially, you know, deduct up to $12,400 uh, of income from your business, right, to your child. And what that would do one, that $12,400 is not taxable for your child, right? So, you know, your kids don't got to, you know, file tax returns on that, okay? And this also will reduce your business tax liability, right? Because it brings down your income. So if I was at $100,000, right? Um, if I was at $100,000 and then I decided oh, I'm going to have my two kids, you know, be my, you know, be my employees, now I just reduced about $24,000, Right. Because uh, this is one of my favorite strategies. If you guys have kids, I love this strategy because what he just said is like, I don't, I don't it's, it's like income shifting and wealth within the family. Mm -hmm. Like if you have kids, you literally can shift, right? $12,400 per child. Per child. Use it from your business income. Which means that money is not, you know, like you're not spending it per se as much as, you know, I guess you are, you know, you make your kids work. They got to do some work. Oh, yeah. But you're shifting that money to your kid who, one, as long as it stays under that amount, doesn't have to pay taxes on it. So this is tax free money for them. You're not going to pay taxes on it because you are reducing it from your tax bill. Mm hmm. But there's another strategy component, which we'll get to, which I absolutely love, which will help your kids build wealth and prepare for later on down the line. So, all right. Sorry, I get excited about that one. Go ahead, John. <laughs> yeah, um, that's, that's, that's the, the highlight, right? You know, you have a, a, if you're a parent, you have a, you're a, a small business owner, and you have kids, you absolutely must, 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 uh, you know, put them on payroll, right? Um, another thing that I would uh, recommend doing is, you know, maxing out your retirement account. Um, if you have, uh, if you, you. Hold on so, before you answer that question. Go ahead and finish your thought. I see, I see, <laughs> I, 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 I see where you're about to go. Finish your thought first. We're going to get to it. I see your question, Jimmy. We're going to get to it in just a second. So look. So you can max you can max out your retirement account. You can max out your retirement account, right? If you have a 401k, right? You can reduce your income by up to $19,500, right? With a 401k or 403b plan, right? So if you have two kids and you know you're again like I said you're making money, you want to try to reduce the business like, you know, your business income, you want to be able to make these elections into your 401k plan and you know, 12000 for your kids, 19000 for yourself. So if you have one child and obviously you have yourself, that's, you know, what, almost $30,000, over $30,000 that you just, you know, not necessarily pissed away, but that you that you legitimately, you know, legally put aside and just kind of shifted it. You know what I mean? Can so you now say you say that amount one more time for adult, like, so LLC owners, what was that dollar amount again for so, a 401k? Nineteen thousand five hundred dollars. So if you took the nineteen thousand five hundred plus that twelve thousand four hundred for your child, that's thirty one thousand nine hundred dollars of income that you can essentially shift away from your bottom line to go towards a, a, a better use, right? So that twelve thousand is going to your child, right? 
your child can learn how to budget with that, right? You don't have to give an allowance. They're working, okay? That $19,500 for the 401k contribution, you know, that is that is money that is going to be going, you know, to be put away for your future, for your retirement, right? So that you're not you're not working every day in vain, you know what I mean? Um, it, it, say if you have, a, a, if you have a, a, a child, a daycare, okay? You have a daycare and the daycare is, you know, doing well financially, you know, sometimes people in that, in that, in the health, in the, uh, in the child care profession, they not seemed as, you know, having a, a solid plan because kids get older, right? You're, you're dealing with a population that's constantly going to be changing, changing and changing and changing. You know what I mean? And just because they get older doesn't mean new, new children aren't born to this world. So you want to make sure that you're, you know, making, maxing out your, your retirement account and, you know, doing something like that to help you for the future so you're not working forever and ever and ever because we just can't do it, okay? So, um, John, really quick, right, because we're talking about retirement accounts, and y'all, I have had to, like, really research this over and over and over again, and even when I think I get it, I have to go back and research it again. There mm -hmm. are different types of retirement accounts. So right. you just brought out the 401k, mm -hmm. right, which gives you a contribution of $19,500. But this is all pre-tax, which means when you withdraw it, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I always got to go back, this is pre-tax money. So before you pay any taxes on this, this $19,500, right. you contribute it to your 401k, but mm -hmm. you have to pay taxes on it when you withdraw it. Right. So it helps you. So that $19,500, that 19, it helps you today, okay? But in the future, when you go to withdraw on it, you'll pay taxes on it later, okay? Now... There's also another option, okay, uh, when we talk about um, uh, individual retirement accounts, right, as a, known as an IRA. Now, there, there are two different IRAs. You have an individual IRA and you have a Roth IRA. The individual Roth IRA, I'm sorry, the individual IRA, you can deduct, you can um, put away up to $6,000, $7,000 if you're over the age of 50 years old, where you're reducing your income, right, to, um, to, to be able to put away. You know, reducing your income that way, but if you have a uh, if you have a, a Roth IRA, right, you can also put away that six thousand dollars, but you pay taxes on it today, okay. But in the future, when you go to take that money out, you're not going to pay taxes on that money federally, okay. So if you invest into a Roth IRA account, you're putting six thousand dollars every year, every year, every year, every year, every year, and that six thousand dollars having the opportunity to grow and to compound. If that six thousand that you keep on putting in over twenty years, if it turns to eight hundred thousand dollars, that means when you go to retire, you're not going to pay any taxes on that eight hundred thousand dollars because you've been paying taxes on it all along. Okay. And so, so here's the quick question I have, right? Mm -hmm. And Jimmy, I'm going to come back to your question. Um. On that Roth IRA, is there an age limit for who can have a retirement account? No, you can set your kids up with an IRA. Oh, I thank you. I want to. I can, want to come can, back to this. You can. You can set your kids up with an IRA. And, okay. And now there are some. Uh, some you have to. There are some parameters you have to to check, but but it is something that can be done. Okay. So, um, so y'all, I just want to bring this, this 360 all the way around. Cause I, I love this. You can pay your kids, put them on the payroll. You can pay them $12,400 each, right? Without paying any, them paying any taxes on it. You not paying any taxes on it. Now, because your kids are not paying taxes on that money, they can contribute $6,000 a year to a Roth IRA which means they didn't pay any taxes on that $6,000 and they won't pay any taxes on that 6,000 when they um, get ready to withdraw it. And there's another benefit to a Roth IRA that I'm hoping we'll be able to get to, but this is beautiful. And then we had a question about, um, you know, can, uh, can there be additional tax deductions if you give your kids IRA funds? So, um, what I will say about what I will say about the the kids IRA uh, account is it has to be set up as a custodial account by the parent or the other adult. Okay, um, so that's the that's the, my little disclosure about that. So if you are gonna run out of here this meeting and say, "Oh, John Drayton said I can get my kid a, a a Roth IRA account," here we go, boom, 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 boom. You can set it up, but there's a way that you have to set it up. Okay, there's a way that you have to set it up, and 
there's also uh, something that has to be done when that child becomes of age to, to, to make that transition, okay? okay? Because you can't be the custodial of that account forever. You will die, okay? You you know, you're, you know hopefully our that children will live. For us a little bit. I'll, I'll hopefully our <laughs> children will live beyond us, okay? But we want to make sure that what we're doing is for them so they have an opportunity that, you know, that we don't have, right? Time. Time is your best opportunity when it comes to investing. And by you setting up, setting up your child with an IRA account, you are setting them up to have the, the best type of return. Because when you, in your working years, you know, you have maybe 40 good working years, okay? But, um, you know, when you're a child, you have another 20 years. What's another 20 years going to do, you know, for retirement or another 10 additional years? So that's 50 years that a child's money has the opportunity to, you know, compound and compound and compound, you know, that's just, uh, that's really just kind of, you know, setting them up. You know well, I, mean? I think, I think this is right. This is a great thing. So some of us may not have kids, may not have kids yet. Some of us do have children or maybe even grandchildren, but one of the things, um, you know, it is the bit, the, the brilliant part and the beautiful part about being an entrepreneur is that those working years don't necessarily have to apply to us per se. And as CEO, we always have the beauty and the privilege to build a company and build the wealth and revenue of a company that mm -hmm. we truly can take a step back and have people working for us and our money working for us. Right. So because we have, um, you know, a, li a little bit more time left, um, what can what can business owners start doing now to lower their taxable income? What should they be paying attention to? Well, first and foremost, when uh, what you want to do is making sure that you you take advantage of of the business tax expenses that can be written off to lower your your tax your tax liability. Right now, the biggest misconception uh, this whole that's been going around all year is that oh, business meals are 100 percent write off in 2020, right? That is true. However, let me let you know a little something, all right? Because they're not going to let you know that. And I, I'm not going to have y'all getting all hemmed up when you go to file your taxes in April talking about, oh, man, on Instagram it said, on Facebook it said, look, yes, business meals are 100%. Uh, you can write them off 100%. All right. However, if you're just entertaining clients, zero, nothing. You get nothing for, enter for entertaining prospective clients, Okay. If you have a business meal with a client, you can that that is limited to fifty percent, okay, of, in terms of what can be written off. If you do office snacks and meals, you know, you know, offer office pizza for the staff or something like that, or office lunch or mission barbecue for the, you know, for, you know, just for like a, you know, just 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 like that. That's only capped at fifty percent. But if you do a company wide party, okay, that is something that is a hundred percent. Uh, right off the boat. Okay. Ho, 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 ho. Because what you just told me is if I want to throw a party, it's 100% off. Correct. But if I just want to have snacks, if I just want to entertain a client, mm -hmm. um, that's only 50, that's only half off. I still well, have to be half. Entertaining clients is entertaining. So, so there's, a, there's a fine line, right, between entertaining clients and then meals and entertainment, right? Because okay. meals and entertainment expenses, right? are 100 percent but there's a fine line okay between what's 100 percent and what's zero percent if i just if i just say oh um you know that's like if i go into a the purpose of where it says entertaining clients at zero percent is so that i don't just walk into the hibachi steakhouse and say all right everybody drinks on me okay that, so, that type of deal nah so that's my not, question that's is this not right now that's, if i want to if I, sorry, John, if I want to have an end of the year Christmas party and I invite my staff as well as clients, could I write the 100% thing off? Yes. Yes. Okay. So this is another question I have because I heard this somewhere and I haven't tried it out yet, or at least I haven't asked you because you're my tax guy. But I heard that if I travel for business somewhere and I travel on a Friday, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. You, go are, ahead. you already know. Go ahead. I already know you're going. Go if ahead. I travel on a Friday to do business, but I do personal stuff Saturday and Sunday, and then I do business on Monday before I fly back out. That the entire trip can be written off as business. Correct. Correct. Yes. Did y'all hear that? 
that's how that's how you want to do it that is how you want to do it okay because if you do it the other way right uh -huh. if you if you go on a business trip you go on, you do your business on friday and saturday right but you stay until monday once your business is con is concluded the day that your business is concluded is a day that those business expense that 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 you can essentially write off that that entire trip you can only write off the first two days if you take care of business up front okay now then you also need to be able to make sure that, that you have a an itinerary that shows what you were doing right that can back it up with you know that can back it up and we're not talking about you know something on paper right you might, you might have to you might have to follow up with an email list you might have to you know show a, a, a listing uh, that this is what happened because if you don't do that then that expense itself can be contested and if your expense is contested then that means that uh you now you got to prove that this actually happened and if this didn't happen then none of it's a, then none of none of it is allowable and that's but, not what you wanted to happen so so here's where right i always have to balance the lawyer in me and the ceo that's like but what i heard is <laughs> <laughs> what i heard is that if i have a legitimate business reason for traveling Mm -hmm. any destination let's just say jamaica mm -hmm. on a friday i do business on a monday i do business and saturday and sunday i relax mm -hmm. my entire trip even if it's at a classy resort mm -hmm. mm -mm. Can be right. written off as a That's business right. expense. So if you decide, you know what, I'm going to do, I am going to host a seminar live from Aruba. And I want to make sure that the people that's in my seminar, that they see that, that icy blue water in that background, okay, and not my apartment, that they see the beach, that they, that they, can, that they can feel what I'm feeling when I'm, as I'm giving this presentation. I'm going to do that on Friday when I, when I touch down. And then I'm also going to do a follow up and I'm going to upload a link onto my company business website on, on Monday, just showcasing the time that we had, the experiences that, we, that we've experienced and how appreciative and thankful that I am to be able to share this with you. That is a when you're blogging like that, vlogging like that, that, that video log, that's a part of the that's a part of the experience. OK, so you went business class, you went first class. First class is you know first class one, don't do that. You want to do business class, okay. First class, no. Business class, yes. You know car rental, yes. Packing bag bag fees, yes. Okay, all of that stuff, good. But as long as you set it up that way, where you're going in on Friday and you're also doing something again on that Monday, now that that makes the entire trip, okay. Maybe you might want to schedule some time in the business conference, right? Even if it's hey, just, just. I have another question. What if yeah. I want to bring my family? If you want to bring your family, we all stay in the same room. All right. So one. And then what happens, right? So that's a separate question, right? So I want to bring my family. They're not employees. That's one question. Then the next question is, what if I want to bring my family and my kids are on my payroll? Well, that 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 changes that, that dynamic because if you bring in your family and the people that you bring on payroll, now that becomes a retreat. Okay. Um, now the the amount of the expenses are going to be limited to the uh, to to the employees itself. So if anybody in your family is not an employee, then those expenses will not may not be uh, may not be um, allowable. So I can so even so the first scenario, right? I I'm going. I'm working on Friday. I'm working on Monday. I decide I'm going to bring my family to Aruba because I like mm -hmm. Aruba better than Jamaica. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it's a I can classify this as a business trip. Right. And it could be a, this can this can be at that point if you bring in your employees with you to the island of Aruba, uh, this can be considered a, a retreat. And, and and let me give you an example, right? I used to work at AT&T. And at the end they would select some time in the beginning of the year usually to book, to award performance of the highest uh, of the of the highest uh, ranking representatives. They would invite them out to a three, four day, you know, all expenses paid uh, trip to Fontainebleau, right, in, um, in, in Miami, 
okay? Uh, as, you know, different, whatever, whatever it is, whether it be Fontainebleau, Bahamas, or whatever, this is, this is something, this is a strategy, right, that businesses do to be able to write off a chunk of money, right, kind of like in a, in a spare no expenses type of deal where they can, it's, it, now one, it's, it's, it's legit. This is legit. This is something that you can definitely do. This is a, a retreat to award performance, to have recognition, and also to uh, you know have enjoyment. Um, so what I hear you saying is I can go to Aruba for a business trip and then I can go to Jamaica for a retreat and it, I can <laughs> write it off mm-hmm. with, okay. Um, there's another thing that I want to talk about because I also heard this strategy and I know we're getting down on time and I really want to make sure we stick to, you know, this time because I honor everybody's time for this, um, for tuning in. Um, there's a, so, you know, I've had the privilege of going to different seminars of wealthy, typically wealthy white men. This is where I've learned this information from of how they run their businesses. Mm -hmm. And one of the strategies I heard blew my mind and it was, you know, um, this, this guy, he owns a business, I believe it was an S corporation mm-hmm. and he has his sons, his children on his staff as employees. And every year, because when you're an S corp, you have to do a, a meeting, you have to meet, um, you know, with your, uh, your, your board, have a meeting, annual meeting. So they do an annual meeting, but what he would do is he would price out local hotels to see what it would cost for him to do this meeting. And then he would pay his wife like that amount of money to have the meeting hosted in their home. Mm-hmm. And it was completely written off. Yes. Yes. That is, uh, that is a, that is a, a viable tax strategy. I, f- I forget the name of it, but uh, yes, that is true. That is something you can do. So when you have an S corporation, uh, there is like a, um, a meeting if it's if it's as long as it's limited to like 14 days throughout the year you have the ability to take that income that you would have paid to you know say a hotel or a venue and charge that right as a as a form of income you know, to, you know as a rent but that is not that that income from that is not taxable now can llc's do this uh i'd have to double check i i'd have to double check i don't believe it's a fine line okay it's a fine line it's one of those uh it's one of those ruling things look it look it's it's all look it's all right you gotta check you gotta check get back to me because i <laughs> look i want to know <laughs> and i'm sure some other people want to know too right because this strategy of being able to have a meeting right and instead of paying a hotel thousands of dollars to have this meeting, especially if you have employees, being able to say, you know what, um, my husband and I, or you know, my family, you know, has a really nice house and a really nice space to have this meeting. I'm just going to pay them this money, right, which reduces my taxable income, keeps it in the family for this meeting. Now, of course, they're going to have to pay taxes on it because you know they're receiving income. But for my business, it reduces my income and I get to write wealth strategy, not just for my business, but community. Maybe you have a friend who has an event, you know, space that you could transfer that money to, right? This is a nice way to kind of keep that wealth um, in the community, keep it in your family and a really nice strategy. Um, so we're again, getting low on time. Are there any other, um, ex- like expenses that maybe we overlook in our everyday life that we should be paying attention to that we can write off? And one of them I'm thinking as, as I sit in my house is my office space. That's right. I was about to say that to your home off. office is one of the things that are, are very commonly overlooked, um, when it comes to, you know, writing off your expenses, right? Uh, business use of your car, education. Um, depreciation expenses, legal fees, right? Because, you know, t- trying to throw the plug out here for my girl. Yes, woo, woo, woo. Legal, legal expenses are, it's, it's necessary, okay? And it is, uh, it's essential. You have to be able to take that money, you know, that you're getting in and, and, do, a, and do an investment to make sure you're protecting yourself. That is the, that is the purpose of why people want to see Shayla Jackson so that they can 
make sure that their business is protected because I know that that's something that you're going to do, you know, for everybody that's listening on this call. So people. Oh, ho, oh, oh, ho, oh. ho. Don't we put me out there like that? Hold on. That that came from John Drayton. That did not come make sure from me. But yeah, listen to this girl. Too, guys, if you have invested in a course with me, if you have invested in actual legal services, anything that you invested, it, you can deduct it and write it off. That is a business expense. So even if you pay for it from your personal money, you might want to make sure that you, you know, do the legal way of making it a business expense mm -hmm. so that you can write it off. This is how you take anything that you might be taking your personal money from and switch it over to your business account. So we talked about the office space, education resources, right. um, startup other examples. Too. And for those startup of expenses is, is huge. People miss out on startup expenses because they start, you decide you, decide you want to start this business. If it's going to take you, you know, ten thousand dollars in capital, that's money that you have to spend in order to get to where you, you know, in order just to just to open up your doors. So that's something that people really, you know, rarely ever take full advantage of the startup those startup expenses. And then even when you're in business, you know, bad debt, you know. I, I put out this, you know, I, I did the services for X, Y, Z. This person owed me fifteen hundred dollars. They ain't pay me. What am I supposed to do? Do I have to recognize that income? No. You write it off. There's a method. Get with your bookkeeper or your accountant. But there is a method. That's awesome because I have had I've had um, previous clients who, you know, unfortunately they did not pay, and John was the one who was able to write that off. Um, of my, my, you know, my income taxes, which, you know, really helps me. Um, but yeah, that's something that we overlook. Like if someone doesn't pay, you don't have to take that as a hit. You can re actually reduce that, even though that was, you know, we think about it as income that really didn't come in. Um, that's still income that you were entitled to. So that can still be reduced. So we have a question and, and it says, um, is there a list of these strategies available to us to view and utilize whether online or should we discuss and go through the specifics with our tax guy? So I'm going to turn it over to our tax guy here, John Drayton, to answer this question. All right. Well, I'll say this. There are there are a plethora of content that's available online. Right. What you can do, you can you feel, you know, depending on how you feel, taking on this, taking on this information go now and find it for yourself or reach out to me, right? Let me help you, right? All this information I have in my head. So the questions that you have, I'm, I'm more than capable of answering them. Just reach out to me. Let me I'll, what I'll do is I'll put my information right here at the bottom of the link. And, um, you know, throughout the, you know, you don't have to reach out to me tomorrow. You got to reach out to me, you know, next week. You know, if you have a question, hit me up. Let's do, a, I'll do a free 15 minute, uh, a free 15 minute uh, consultation where you had the floor with me for 15 minutes and you and I could talk about everything under the sun absolutely for free. Okay. So Elizabeth, I am working on John and I'm so grateful that Jimmy, who is his beautiful, beautiful wife, has already put it in the chat box that he should write an ebook. I have been working on with John. <laughs> um, you know how you give those subtle hints to other CEOs to take what is in his head and put it into a container that he can then give to other people. Because just like you want more information so that you can have it with you, look, so do I, so do so many other people. But one of the things that I did not mention, and I, I wanna make this available, so I hope all of you register, because that is the only way that I have your email address, is that I have a, a short, brief um, business deduction checklist that just shows you some of the business expenses that you can deduct. It also um, has a quick brief list of personal expenses that you can write off as business expenses. So for instance, if you have an Apple Watch and um, you, know, you use your Apple Watch for business, right? To send emails, to check your business, you can start writing that off as a business expense because you're using it for business. So there are some personal expenses that you might not think about um, that you could write off. And John, correct me if I'm wrong, but even some of your, you know, not all of it, but even some of your electricity, especially if you have a home office, your water bill, if you're using it as your, your business office kitchen, um, there are some bills that your business could be paying the expenses for. 
absolutely you are 100 percent right when you go through the uh home office visit the the uh the home office deduction um it allows you to kind of go through all of that so you definitely want to make sure that you utilize that uh, that home office deduction whenever you're filing your taxes um you know this year and if, it, if you haven't done it last year or the year before that you can actually take advantage and do an amendment to make sure that you go back and capture those items so if you owed um you owe taxes you know, the last two years or if you didn't get back a, a return that you thought was as big as you that could have that could have been you can go back and do that amendment up to three years and you can go and capture that home office uh, business deduction use form which could lower your tax liability significantly so guys th this has only been an hour right there are so many strategies um but i hope that you are able to get um so much out of this if you have questions this is the time to please um you know write your questions in the chat box if you are on by phone because i see a couple of people on by phone please unmute yourself to ask your questions this is a time where literally we have the tax guy here ask him your questions um, because I certainly, y'all heard me asking about Aruba. I was not hesitating to ask my questions. Um, I wasn't even planning on a business trip to Aruba, but now that I know, I may have to consider it. <laughs> um, so are there any questions? And while we wait for questions to come through, um, one of the things I do want to point out is that if you would like to set up a consultation with John Drayton, um, Drayton Tax Pros, there is a free 15 minute consultation that he does provide. And you can um, send a email to info at DraytonTaxPros.com. That's info at DraytonTaxPros, with the S on the end, dot com, to schedule your free 15-minute consultation. So make sure you write that information down, whether you need it now or later. And if you registered through um, the link for tonight, then you will receive an email um, in the next couple of days, just being honest with you, maybe this weekend, um, with the link to download the um, business deduction checklist that I offer. It's free. There's no charge for it. But it will help you begin to see, um, as you go through your business activities, what you can begin to deduct. But also, one of the things um, that you guys should be considering is how to even structure your day and your business activities okay so that you can begin to deduct some of um, your business expenses. So we do have, um, it looks like one person who unmuted their phone who wants to ask a question. And then I'm gonna come back to um, a question we have in the chat box. Hi, Latasha, welcome. Um, and I'm gonna have um, the person on the phone who unmuted to ask their question first. So go ahead. All Good right. evening, everyone. This is Mia Vance. Hey, John. Hey. Um, John is actually my tax guy. He's been um, doing my taxes, my business taxes, and my personal taxes for about, I don't know, 10 years now. Um, but I had a question as far as how to um, merge the nonprofit and for-profit um, when I am preparing taxes for this year. So the question is, how do you prepare how do you what steps do you need to do to take your nonprofit as well as your for-profit business yes all right so when you prepare your uh, your nonprofit you want to be completing a uh, a, a 990 okay so the 990 is going to be a separate a separate tax return that, that you do that's from, apart from your from your personal your um your business, are you a sole proprietorship? Like, are you, uh, is it a partnership or do you have this business with other people? Um, it like, is a sole proprietor. Okay, so as a sole proprietorship, right, you can file, uh, you can file that, that business along with your personal taxes, okay? There's no, no issue with that. And you may wanna uh, get with Shayla after just to kind of find out if you have your business, you know, protected in the way in the right manner in which it should be um, um but as far as with the nonprofit, uh you, you don't you can you cannot file them together okay uh, like meaning like like how you can easily file your your your, uh, your your profit business with your personal taxes that's not something that you'll be able to do with the nonprofit. the nonprofit has to be separate and it has to be on a 990. okay got it 
Thank you. So one of the things I want to bring out, like the whole nonprofit question threw me because I was like, Ooh, I, we didn't even cover nonprofits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did not. But one of the things that I, I know um, for another client looking into is that a nonprofit can have some business activities, correct? Correct. Yes, it can. And like, so with that, because, you know, nonprofit is also like a tax, you know, strategy as well. Um, mm -hmm. But how much, I, I can't remember the percentage, but how much of the, the nonprofit, right? So this is not having a separate business. This is the nonprofit operating some of his activities as a business um what's the percentage of that do you remember or recall off the top of your head um let's see uh, uh is it, i think it's like uh, around 15 percent or something or 10 it's something like it's a low percentage how much how much business can a nonprofit like how much business can a nonprofit generate before they have to pay taxes well well when when the nonprofit is conducting business right they'll have to off of based upon based on what they're doing they will need to um they'll need to want to schedule with you know, with the place they're operating in to, to, to collect the sales and use tax unless everything itself is going towards like membership dues or um membership dues or or, or unless it's fundraising so that's kind of like that that's kind of like what, what usually what i've seen nonprofits do Whenever they have a fundraiser or they're selling something, they're always utilizing these uh, these funds to go towards the mission of the nonprofit itself. So okay. so long as so long as that that's the purpose, in terms of what you know what that nonprofit is doing to to sell whatever they're selling, or even if the or even if the um if the the business is um I'm sorry if the nonprofit has like a, a apartments that they rent out to. So long as the funds from these activities are going towards the mission uh, of the nonprofit, then then those funds, uh, again, are are not to be, are, you know, are, are protected by the nonprofit. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's go back to um, Latasha's question, which she asks: How old can children be as employees? So I'm um, that question: How old um, is you know the minimum age for a child to be an employee? Uh, I want to say 14. If they're under 14, then they have to be like a um, a model or performer or entertainer or something like that, like with a with a special with a special permit. So, so if I had a product campaign and I just had a newborn baby, mm -hmm. and I wanted my newborn baby to be in my product campaign, I can literally pay my child a thousand dollars to model in my photos. The so. Yes, yes, yes. Like so, there's there's kind of like no no age limit for for employing a child, but it's it could be difficult to justify the wages that you pay to a child to a five year old. You know what I mean? So you kind of have to treat your treat your your kids kind of the same way, like uh, as you would other employees. But you gotta be able to one keep your good records, and you gotta you know gotta, gotta still gotta watch gotta monitor their hours. Like unless you can't put your you got to monitor your hours, right? Unless is it, it comes down to structure. You have to have structure within your business. You can't just say, "All right, I got you know, I got um a niece, I got a nephew, you know, they're gonna be the they're gonna be the face of my of my organization, right?" It has to make sense. You can't just say, "All right, I'm gonna do it this way," right? Because in business, right, yes, there are legal loopholes, but you have to take the measures to make sure that you can pass it. Because the last thing you want is for you know your business to be contested at, or say, "Nick." These are your employees, but are they really your employees? And then they say, oh, you know what? You ain't in the business. This is a hobby. All this income that you made, this is all taxable. That's the last thing you want to happen. So with John, so, okay. So the question I just asked, right, is usually as business owners, right, we were like, okay, I want to pay the maximum amount because I want to take advantage of this 12400 But what John is talking about is it's kind of similar to if you decide, you decide that you want to be an S corporation or be taxed as an S corporation, which is you have to pay a reasonable salary which means like, what would the market be paying for a child model? Or what would, you know, what would someone comparable to your business be paying for this type of service? So you wouldn't be paying a thousand dollars for a kid to do some research online, you know, file paperwork, right? That, that would be a little bit too much. So you would want to make sure that whatever you are paying is considerable to that. And I love the thing that you just said, because I didn't even think about 
um, you know, that that 12,400 is not just for my kids, but I have nieces and nephews um, that, you know, <laughs> I, I, look, look, I didn't even think about it. I was like, I have nieces and nephews who are into entrepreneurship that I literally could have been hiring. Like they love social media. Y'all, I would prefer not to be on social media that much. Mm -hmm. So I didn't even think about, I could be hiring them to do some of my graphic artwork, my videos, putting it together. Um, um, so there's another question. Does a child on a, a vlog, right? A video log, video blog count? I would say if they're acting as a model, yes, mm -hmm. right? Because influencers get paid to be present in the Correct. Mm -hmm. um, so some of this stuff, you can kind of use it. And then there's another question. And I'm going to try not to laugh, y'all. There's another question that Latasha asked, which it says, um, can an LLC ask for donations? For instance, instead of a price for a product or service, can they ask for donations instead? Now, there's some context that she gave me behind this question, which I ain't going to put all the way out there. All right. Um, but you did make me almost laugh um, while we were recording. Um, <laughs> essentially, if you are offering a product for any type of money, it is not a donation. Right. It is an exchange of money for the product. So in that case, regardless of what they are paying Right. And they should be paying something. Let me let me just be let, let me be honest right here for anybody who struggles with a poverty mindset. Um, anybody who struggles with the, you know, like maybe you're a believer and you're in business. You are in business. You are in business to make a profit. You are not in business to run your business into the ground. Right. So if you are selling a product, even if that product is you and what you know, you deserve to get paid and compensated fairly for whatever value you place on that product. Now, if you're just trying to figure out, you know, what should I, um, what should I charge? That's fine, right? Because we all go through that process of trying to figure out, well, what, what would the market pay for this? But can I tell y'all a secret? And I know we're getting a little bit off of, actually it's not getting too much off of wealth, you know, just maybe not on the tax side, is that regardless of what amount you put on your product or service, somebody will pay for it. Mm -hmm. Let me say that somebody will pay. And oftentimes, depending on what your product and service is, people will pay more than what you put on there. So if you're just trying to figure out what the, where, where the market is, put a price tag on it and just get started. But typically LLCs, it wouldn't be a donation. If you decide that, you know, hey, it's pay what you, what you want. Um, I did that for my first ebook, pay what you want, but I put a minimum of $5. Why? Because I understand that if you allow for people to pay you zero, they will get what you have for free and not compensate you. And everything that you put into your product or service was not free. Your time was not free. Your energy was not free. If you went to school for what you do, that definitely was not free. Some of y'all got the student loans to prove it. So you want to make sure that you're operating your business as a business. And so even though this is CEO fireside chat, part of CEO, you are a CEO now, if you are operating a business, even if you are a sole prop, but sometimes our mind has to catch up to the CEO mindset of how to operate a business, not a charity, not a nonprofit, but an actual business. And in business, we're talking about profits. So there's some questions we didn't get to. I hope that answers your, um, your question, Latasha. And just remember, um, because this is a part of taxes too, that if you are selling um, physical products and if you're in the state of Maryland, now even digital products are taxed 6%. So you want to make sure you have your sales and use tax license. That's a license to operate your business, but also that you are collecting that 6% sales tax so that you can pay that to the state of Maryland. Or if you're in another yeah. state joining us, um, collect that state's tax and pay it to that state. That's right. Um, so again, absolutely nothing wrong with any questions you guys have. Um, some of you are maybe new to me, Shayla Jackson here, who is your host for this evening. Um, we are um, a little bit beyond the time that I had allotted for this, but I always want to make sure that you guys get everything you need, everything you want to know. There are some tax strategies we didn't really go through, which is um, you know, some of you may be married, some of you um, may get married in the future, which is how do you, and maybe this will be our last question for tonight, unless someone else has a 
um, a question, um, another question, but how do you, how, what, what are maybe a couple of strategies for um, spouses, right? Who um, they, they are together, they both have jobs. So they both have jobs making, let's say five figures. Uh, maybe let's say they make, both of them make $70,000 a year. So combined income of $140,000. They both have businesses that are generating $100,000 in revenue a year. Mm-hmm. Uh, my question, so that that's one of those loaded questions. It's going to definitely take us way beyond, but I'll say this, okay? It's going to, it's going to vary based on your tax situation. I'll say that, okay? And also you want to go with, you want to look at you want to look at each scenario as which one is going to lead to me paying the lowest amount in taxes. Okay, that's a strategy in itself. Okay, joint joint um, joint tax returns usually offer the best benefits when it comes to like deductions and so on and forth like that. When you're going with uh, when you're going with just your filing as a married filing separate, you lose out on a lot of uh, a lot of opportunities, a lot of credit, a lot of uh, exemptions that you may be uh, able to get. So you want to really weigh that in terms of what's going to be the most beneficial to, you know, which, what are your, what's, what's going to be the tax bracket if I file, you know, as a uh, married filing separate, what's going to be the tax bracket if I file married filing joint, and then looking at, you know, as far as the business, do I have all of my documentations in order? Do I have my retirement accounts? Did I take full advantage of maximizing my retirement account, of maximizing my fringe benefits? You know, did I do everything that I had to do to make sure that I captured the actual income or the profit for this business? You know what I mean? Did I do tax planning? Did I, you know, do my home office deduction? Did I record my mileage? You know, did I, did I record any, um, my, my bookkeeping, is, is my bookkeeping accurate? There's so many different factors that kind of goes into this question. It is not, it's not a simple, it's not a simple answer. So again, he gave us the tax accountant's version of the lawyers. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> but what I gleaned out of what you said was one, um, looking at in your filing. So we talked about in the beginning, the difference between tax planning, which is a little bit of what we're discussing, right? Tax strategy and tax prep. And what you just gave us was, I think, really, really beautiful, right? Really good, which is looking to see, okay, which one is going to lower if you have a spouse, right? Which one is going to give us the lowest, um, put us in the lowest income bracket, if whether we file together or we file separately. So that's one. And then in our individual businesses, did we take advantage of every single thing that we could have done as far as writing off business expenses, home office, um, retirement accounts? And so there's one thing um, that I do want to bring up right with that is when you are retirement accounts as an LLC owner, can I also contribute to my retirement account if I had one as the employer as well say that again I'm sorry so you know we're talking about taking advantage of right if so I asked this question right guys about you know if you have a spouse both of you have businesses and you have income so all that is money coming in that will raise your taxable income into the highest tax bracket Um, especially if both of you are making seventy thousand dollars a year right so that's one hundred forty thousand dollars combined Plus your business is bringing $100,000. So that's $2,100,000. That brings you into the highest tax bracket. Uh, I believe that's the highest tax bracket. I have, no, it's the highest tax bracket. So with that, you are paying the most taxes in your individual tax bracket because the LLC is passed through, meaning it goes all the way through to your individual tax return. So because of that, right? John gave us a brilliant idea, which is like, do we file separately or do we file joint? Then how do I take advantage within my own business, reducing all of my, um, my, my, uh, business, um, my business expenses, right? To lower how that $100,000 from being taxed. My question is, because we talked about retirement accounts. Usually if you have an employer, right? Your employer can contribute to the retirement account and you can contribute, right? Like a match. But if I have a a retirement account through my LLC 
and I'm working for my LLC, can I also do the double match? So I contribute as an individual and I contribute as an employer. Can I do that? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Now, here's where you want to where you want to um, kind of line it up, because say if you if you set a rule and you say, you know what, all my employees, I'm going to do uh, I'm going to do I'm going to do a match of. I don't know, say ten thousand dollars, you get 20 employees. Is that rule going to be the same for all of your employees? You know what I mean? So you want to um, you want to you want to speak with a retirement uh, advisor, right? One of the account, retirement account advisor to, to see what is going to be the best that you can do, right? As far as like how much, how much can you, um, can you put aside? How much can you do your match for? Uh, because uh, for the owner's match, what an owner can write off is, a, is different. It, it varies from what, uh, just what, what an employee would get, okay? Um, and then in order to find out what that figure is, you need to speak with the, uh, with the, with the retirement investment advisor and they could provide you with more solid uh, hand platted information uh, more than I can give you. But yes, you, that is something you can do. So that's another strategy, guys. And so the other strategy, too, is that the people who work for you, and this is, we don't have time to go into all of this, but everybody doesn't need to be an employee. They can be an independent contractor. And that's a whole nother way to save on taxes because when it's you as an employer and the employee, which you would have to be on your own payroll to do this, right? You're paying yourself a salary. You can contribute double to your retirement account, meaning that you can save way more money. Now, what John said, which is be caught, you know, be careful about this is because if you do bring on employees, that means you have to have the same standard applied to all um, of the retirement accounts, even for them. But if you bring on independent contractors, you don't because an independent contractor is not an employee and they don't have the same rights as employee. But you have to make sure that you categorize them correctly because the IRS will come after you for their taxes. And you see this in the news. And this is why this conversation is so important because um, state revenues have decreased significantly because of COVID, because mm -hmm. of businesses. That's they lost right. a lot of tax revenue. They have gone after and they have been arresting people for failure to pay their sales tax failure to pay other taxes, right? You hear President Biden talking about his tax plan. So all of this is going to come down to who do we tax? And that includes at the individual level and at the corporate level. And if you're paying attention, we talked about the different business entities that pass through to the individual, meaning it affects you too. Um, so all of these strategies, I hope you guys are able to take, um, take away, utilize, um, begin to, um, just make wiser decisions. We have, um, one last question and then we're going to wrap it up and I'm going to turn it over to you for last thoughts before I close this out, John. Um, what license I need for the state of Maryland to sell my products? Beverly, that is a, um, sales and use tax license. That is a free license that you can get through the Maryland Business Express website. If you have an account, you just log into your account, request one, and you will get a little paper license in the, in the mail. Um, you've probably seen them in the stores where whenever you sell, you have it with you. Um, and it basically is a license giving you the right to sell physical products in the state of Maryland. So um, if there aren't any more questions, John, do you have any more, um, any last remarks? Any last tips or things that we should take away? Um, I, I just want to, I want to thank you all for taking the time to listen to what I have to say, a uh, little old me. Um, and um, I just want to implore you guys all to, you know, take the time to invest in, you know, the right person that's going to help you, you know, with your business, whether that's tax planning or tax preparation, you know, don't, don't make the mistake of, uh, filing your taxes late or putting them off to the last minute uh, because it's just going to be a chain reaction. You know, there's whatever, whatever can possibly go wrong, it will go wrong. Get ahead of it, you know, and stay ahead of it. All right. Well, 
guys thank you so much um thank you john for taking the time this evening to be with us to share all of the wealth of knowledge that is in your brain for us um hopefully that is coming in an ebook sometime soon before the end of the year is out <laughs> um <laughs> but guys i want to i want to just thank you all for attending thank you guys um so much for attending the first ceo fireside chats um, you know, this is the first one. I'm hoping there will be others. Um, you know, I just wanted to provide a conversational style where CEOs could come together, talk and give you CEOs, um, you know, the information you need. And I think starting out in September, as we go into the last three months of the year where tax planning is a focus of the wealthy and we are all wealthy here. Um, this is a great tool to start thinking, okay, in my business, what can I do in the next three months to lower my tax bill for next year? So I'm going to put a plug in here right now for Drayton Tax Pros, who, if you do not have your bookkeeping set up, if you do not have your, um, your books, your accounting processes set up appropriately to track and to organize your expenses, whether you use QuickBooks or another service, please reach out to Drayton Tax Pros who can provide that service for you. Because let me tell you, he sat down and he organized my books and I have not wanted to touch it since because it is perfect. Um, but it's also helped me keep track of every expense and dollar I spend, especially for educational purposes. Because I think that is one of the biggest expense that um, business owners we will have to grow our businesses that I can write off that $1,000 or that $500 or that $20 education that I invested in um, to my business. So it's not coming from my personal account. So I just want to plug that in. And again, if you would like a free consultation um, for 15 minutes with Drayton Tax Pros, you can email info at draytontaxpros.com. So again, thank you so much for everyone attending the September uh, CEO Fireside Chats with John Drayton, CEO of Drayton Tax Pros. My name is Shayla Jackson, and I thank you all for attending. That is all for this evening. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a blessed day.